We grow up surrounded by tangible cultural artifacts and intangible cultural values. And we're trained to believe from our earliest childhood forward that these artifacts, that these values are intrinsic, unquestionable, transcendental, necessary to our lives as human beings or necessary to the future of our culture, our nationality, our creed. Grew up walking around downtown Toronto. The opera? Really? The ballet? We have a ballet company in downtown Toronto. Who, who goes to the ballet? Here, here in Victoria, Canada, it's the same thing. The government pays millions of dollars to keep this opera company going, to keep this ballet theater going? Really? Really? Oh, no, 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 you can't question it. These cultural institutions, these cultural artifacts, no matter how many millions of dollars people pour into them, no matter how, no matter how many of millions of your dollars, of taxpayers' dollars, you can't question. This is inviolable unquestionable, sacrosanct. This has some kind of innate value, even if nobody goes to see it. So what? None of your friends have ever been to the ballet. You've never heard of anyone. No one's ever told you it was a good ballet or a good opera. That's not the point. It's, it's unquestionable. You can't question it. To a very significant extent, the discourse surrounding habitat conservation, um, you may say the most practical aspect of the philosophy of nature, it's put in this same hallowed, unquestionable, sacrosanct category. And now for more than 20 years, I've been trying to drag it out of that unquestioned, unthinkable category and get people to really think about it. So about four years ago, I was talking about this a lot within veganism as a movement. I got a question from a, a longtime viewer today, and he says he's been watching every single video I uploaded for, for years, but I'm guessing it's two years or three years because he hadn't seen the last videos I made on this topic. The video I'm making today is in response to questions that came in from that viewer. But as you'll get the impression already, his questions were of a somewhat different nature. And my answer is going to be significantly different from anything I've, I've said about this before. Um, it's not an easy question. It's not a simple question. It's just a question that I already thought about a great deal and struggled with a great deal more than 20 years ago. So it seems simple to me. It seems simple to me because this is an area of philosophy I was interested in for such a long time, such a long starting such a long time ago, and that I have dealt with again and again face to face with people. Now look, it's really important in dealing with these sacrosanct, unquestionable cultural values in our societies. It's really important to point out, no, the value of these things is just decided politically. It's just determined by 12 people wearing suits and ties in a parliament building. Or if you live in a dictatorship, it might be 12 people wearing suits and ties in some military bureau or some government bureau where there's no parliament and no elections. But ultimately, human beings sit down at a desk. It's not that many human beings. And there's not that much democratic participation. There's not that much transparency. There's not that much. But some, some human beings sit down at a desk and decide, how much is this opera really worth? How, how much are we putting into the ballet this year? And it can be any number. It can be zero, and it can be 10 million, it can be 30 million, it can be billion. This is just a political decision. And you can regard this as having cultural value, and you can train yourself to perceive that value as innate in these things, but how much should a school teacher's salary be in Canada? I confronted a professor about this. Let me tell you something, I won. I won this debate. <laughs> there were not two sides to this argument. Um, this, prof this professor kept referring to school teachers in Canada as being underpaid. That they were paid less than what they would be paid naturally, meaning the free market, Meaning, what, what does nature mean in this context? And I, th this was kind of sort of Socratic method. I confronted her on this, and ultimately the only conclusion comes, I, I pointed out to her, I said, there is no natural salary. There is no natural price for what school teachers get paid. This is something entirely created by a political process, preferably a democratic political process, but quite likely an arbitrary political process where, for example, the teachers have some politicians on their side, they have some lawyers hired by their union, and they demand a certain amount of money, 
And then there are 12 or 15 politicians who sit down in a room and they decide how much money they're going to offer. It is 100% a political decision. There is no role for nature in this equation. We're dealing entirely with the theater of human created values. Values that human beings impose on the natural world. And if you keep doing it from your earliest childhood till the day you go to your grave, you start to see these things as having intrinsic value, but you're, you're, you're really just demonstrating the extent to which you're brainwashed. Um, this is not to say that I'm claiming teachers are paid too much or too little in Canada. My point is, if you're going to make that argument, you can't appeal to a natural price to compare to what those teachers are currently being paid. You can't just appeal to what they're really worth as something known or knowable. Now you tell me, what are elephants worth? If you live in a poverty-stricken country like Laos, tiny poverty-stricken country just north of Cambodia, we could use Cambodia as an example, we could use Sri Lanka as an example, we could use Myanmar. What, what, are, what are the elephants worth? What are the monkeys worth? The last tigers. They got some uh, exotic jungle goats you ain't even heard of, like the spindle horn, endangered species. They got, uh, they got lorises, very charming creatures, vaguely resemble a monkey, but in terms of evolution. What's, what's it worth? What's it worth? And you're sitting there with a finite budget as the government. You got to worry about the military, education, health care. You're in a country. When I live there, medical doctors are being paid 15 US dollars a month. All right, so they're all corrupt. All, every doctor has to take bribes because the salary they get from the government is embarrassingly low. The whole society is corrupt due to this kind of systemic underpayment of government employees. How, how, much, how much are elephants worth? And that's just if I'm asking the question in terms of the government paying for the opera, paying for the ballet, paying for these other things we, we value as human. I'm not even factoring in the opportunity cost that's a technical term in economics. The opportunity cost is if you value these elephants, if you value these monkeys, if you value these trees, if you value this habitat that they, they uh, rely on, that's going to cost you way more money because it means you have to sit there and say, no, this Japanese charcoal corporation wants to cut down the forest, get a lot of money from the wood, and then plant this particular type of mass monocrop that gets grown very quickly and turned into charcoal briquettes to export to Japan so they can grill fish on huge, huge business. Loss. Oh, there's this other company that wants to mine gold, whatever the example may be. Uh, there was a little bit of gold mining in Laos when I was there, and they would come up with all these excuses as to why the gold mine justified cutting down jungle remarkably far away from the gold. I remember, I remember a forest being cut down um, to build a golf course, and I was very upset about it. And I talked to some government officials, and I remember this is not the only case in this happened. They said, "Look, man, if you've been out there, I said trust me, that forest has already been cut down." <laughs> they said, "Trust me, this they, it may be forest on the map. If you go, out there, don't worry. They're building that golf course over a parking lot. There's nothing there." <laughs> Any case, um, what are these things worth? Many of us are trained from birth to regard the forest as a kind of temple, to regard nature as a kind of cultural product, paradoxically, to regard elephants as if they are statues. And in the same way that we justify the government having a budget for museums, what, what do museums exist for? To preserve and present something beautiful for human consumption, for human delectation, for human enjoyment. right? And, you don't want to know. You don't want to know how many millions of dollars your government is wasting on museums. Um, my point is not to say that elephants are worthless. That's not my perspective. My point is to say we're just we're just dealing with my perspective and your perspective and human perspectives. The terrifying reality is that there are twelve or fifteen people in expensive suits who are going to make this decision and who already have made this decision in the country you're living in right now, right? Which species can be hunted and which are protected? They sit there and look at a map and they take a pencil and they outline the area where it's illegal to cut down trees 
and the outline, the area where all the trees are going to be cut down and harvested for lumber, right? So I, this is, a, a, with almost no exceptions, what I've just described is, is a global phenomenon. This is the reality of government, and it's the, it reflects the profoundly political nature of nature itself in the 20th century, that the value of nature is going to be arrived at by small numbers of people in positions of political power, preferably democratically, preferably with, with some transparency. Right? Now, from my perspective, the budget for the ballet is very difficult to justify. The budget for the opera is very different, difficult to justify. And I got to say something. If I live in Toronto, Canada, I'm looking at the ballet and I'm looking at the opera and I'm saying, if you shut this down, it will leave the world no poorer. Nothing will be lost. There, there is nothing of value that will be irretrievably lost. It is not that we will be snuffing out the great Canadian tradition of third-rate imitations of Italian culture. Nothing is going to be lost here. Right? Now, by contrast, I have a totally separate genre of videos where I'm talking about the importance of trying to motivate the Canadian government to have education for indigenous languages. So the languages like the Inuit language, Cree, Ojibwe, Mohawk, in the United States, Navajo, First Nations languages, Inuit. Okay. If you allow those languages to go extinct, they're g -g -g gone forever and something really is lost, right? There is actually a very different, difficult, interesting question to be asked. What if we allow our indigenous culture to go extinct? Because that doesn't exist in Italy and it doesn't exist in Germany. And then I think people have to sit in a room and make a very different set of decisions about government, fu government funding for the arts. 98% of government funding for the arts in Canada is a scam that should be abolished. It's horrifying what's done with taxpayers' money in the name of the arts. But of course, already there, we have a significant shift in terms of the underlying values and the palpable real world objectives and the consequences of the decisions we make if we don't pay to preserve this. Right? The most fundamental criterion that differentiates the elephants from the ballet dancers, that differentiates all these questions of habitat conservation, conservation of wild species, from the questions of merely human cultural preservation, is that nature, by definition, is self-instantiating and self-sustaining. All right? The point is, the forest left to its own devices will regenerate and even expand the forest. We don't have to do that for it. Okay. You would not believe how much money it takes just to keep a painting on the wall from rotting. You would not believe how much money your government is spending right now to maintain churches and cathedrals and synagogues. You have no idea. And if you walk through, you just think, oh, it's a stained glass window. You know what it takes to preserve a window that's more than 500 years old? You know what it takes to sustain mosaics and paintings that are on, you know, paintings, normally they're made out of egg white and egg yolk, by the way. You know, the actual materials the painting are made of, they don't last for a thousand years, you know. It's not made, it's not made out of steel. And guess what? Steel doesn't last for a thousand years. All of these, you know, things you can take for granted as inert, is sitting around you. Even, you know, uh, ancient cultural artifacts that are made of solid stone, like Stonehenge in England. You want to look up how much money it takes to create the illusion of stasis, just to make those things sustainable for human beings to still be able to see and touch that cultural heritage or that history, all right? Left to its own devices, nature will reproduce itself, restore itself, expand itself, right? And the works of man will degenerate into dust. If you've seen other videos on my channel, you know when it comes to the Catholic Church, the whole legacy of the Dark Ages, I think there are a lot of institutions we really have to have the self-discipline now to stop paying money to sustain, stop paying money to restore and rebuild. We have to have the maturity to let them, finally. To generate into dust. All right, and then there are other decisions we're going to make where we decide, hey, 
the plays of William Shakespeare still have some meaning and some relevance to the modern world. And we're not ready to let go of that. We're not going to... Um, there's a species of monkey in Yunnan that eats almost nothing but moss and lichen. They're like called like lichenovores. Right? It's very beautiful and haunting sort of monkey. Cute, cute too. The indigenous people of that part of Yunnan regarded them as quite literally the ghosts of the dead. Now, the behaviors of these monkeys, along with their somewhat ghastly appearance, uh, all contributed to this cultural tradition. They have no nose. They're noseless monkeys, so they have slits, just like looking at a human skull. And I'm sure this is part of what inspired the indigenous people of this man. So you seem to be looking at a living human skull. And most of their bodies as adults, uh, the fur is black, but the face and sort of like a wreath around the face. There are wisps of white. And when humans go past, um, just behaviorally, they'll come down from the trees and they'll just stick their face through the trees to look at you out of curiosity because they can recognize that you as a human are something not so different from most. So you get these ghastly white faces coming out of the forest to look at you with curiosity and they have no noses. They have these just nose slits on this pale white face. Look at you. So the indigenous people there thought of these as the spirits of their own dead ancestors, spirits of you know human beings reincarnated or just not even reincarnated. They just regarded these as ghosts uh, walking the earth. Now, obviously, I do not accept the cultural value that that culture in the past imposed onto that animal. As of the last time I read about it in their natural habitat those monkeys were down to their last tree. There was really one last tree and one last tiny piece of habitat. And the problem is what they're evolved for, what they're used to is collecting this stuff like moss and lichen over a huge area. You can imagine they've got to be able to go over that huge area without being attacked by dogs. Dogs can run them down and tear them to shreds, especially if they can't run up a tree to escape. There are all these terrifying problems and it's just teetering on the brink of extinction. And... Um, we can keep them alive in zoos. That's no problem. I've seen them in zoos. You know, can you sustain the habit? Can you draw a line on the map and say, no, this far, no further for human civilization? You can use the trees up to a certain point and then it's got to stop. All right. Now, if you can do that, it's, it's so little to ask. We get to live in a world with these monkeys. And in Sri Lanka, I mean, I can remember getting out of a car at the side of the road and the Elephant was right there where human beings were really living among wild elephants, not tamed elephants. They also live among tamed elephants. Another story. But you know, having wild elephants and monkeys and to have this, you know, surrounding you, all right? When we're not even really questioning what is it worth? What do we have to justify in terms of government policy in the same way as we would for the opera and the ballet? We're just asking is this meaningful enough? Is this valuable enough to justify the government drawing that line on the map and saying no more? This is the end of human civilization. Human civilization has some value and it's finite and it's ultimately the job of a small number of people in a room in positions of political authority to define exactly where it starts and stops, exactly where it ends. And to say these things in nature, whether it's a monkey or a mouse, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be something so photogenic as, a, as an elephant, it may be species. You know, these things don't exist for our entertainment, for our edification, like pictures in a museum, right? Nature exists for itself, all right? And, and we, we also, we as humans, can recognize we exist for ourselves. We don't need some further justification or purpose for our existence, but that existence is finite. It's not that we can't use 100% of the landmass of China or 100% of the landmass of Sri Lanka, Laos, Cambodia, or even can't. It's not that we can't. It's that we shouldn't. It's that ultimately there is an infinite, infinite difference between managing to sustain those few trees in that one park so that that population of monkeys can regenerate. If you're talking about elephants, 
you know, to say, oh no, okay, this last forest, and God knows that's the situation in Cambodia, <laughs> Laos, northeastern Thailand, you know, <laughs> very often you're down to your last little patch. Say, oh no, 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 no. It's not that it's only a 1% difference to go from 99% extinct to 100% extinct. Something is lost there that human beings can never make again. All right, we can close down the opera, we can close down the ballet, and you know what, maybe in the next 20 years, fashions change, and, and people in Canada are once again fascinated with Italian opera, the way they were in the 1920s. And you know what, people go out and rent a venue and start performing opera again. There's a new hit movie, the, the new hit YouTube videos with opera and ballet, fine. You know, you can, people can go into the library and blow the dust off the manuscripts and start performing opera again, right? You can bring that back 20 years from now or 200 years from now. It almost seems inevitable that it will happen at some point, um, right? Once a language goes extinct, it's gone forever. You can never bring it back, right? The, there's something that happens with a mother transmitting a language to a child that can never be reproduced with a chalkboard and a textbook, right? There's, there's something about a language that's lost forever when it's driven to extinction. There's something about elephants, there's something about walruses, there's something about mice, whatever the species may be, right? When you take that step to drive it to extinction, right? It, it, it can never be brought back. And of course, that's not just because of the genetics involved. It's not just because of the continuous succession of animals living in the wild and transmitting their instincts and experience. It's because of the habitat, right? You can burn down the church and you can build another church. That's what they're doing right now in Paris, France with rebuilding the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, you can never rebuild the wilderness. You can never replace the wild once it's gone.